Okay, now uh, I'm going to be talking about recurrent neural networks. It is another type of neural network. It is different from convolutional neural networks and it's a bit advanced too, yeah? So this, uh, these are the things I'll be talking about, the basic idea behind uh, why recurrent neural networks, why, why use them and where it is used and some use cases, yeah? That's what we are concerned about rather than what it is, where to use it, right? And then I'll be giving a demo on story generation. So the data, the data that is used for uh, the recurrent type of neural networks are sequential in nature. So any idea what that might be? Maybe converting uh, uh, music or sound into numbers? Uh, okay, uh, not exactly, but See, music, uh, it, is, it has the time component in it, right? See, something like an image, it's just one input. But as, uh, in the case of video, it's just moving images. So it's sequential. It's uh, like the data is moving from one image to the other. So that is where we'll be using our RNN networks. For example, in speech recognition, you give the waveform or your audio sample, and you need to get the text out of it. How do you do it, right? You can do it using a convolutional neural network, but that would mean for each word, maybe a hello, you need to train a model, right? And for another word, it would say that, yeah, for, for if you have 10,000 words, you would need 10,000 categories, right? That would become cumbersome. So that is where we will use uh, something called RNN, right? So that will be able to look at the sequence and get information from it. And the other case is in music generation, right? where we might not even give an input, but it'll be generating music samples. Like if you train the model using uh, jazz music, right? And if you try to predict, it'll predict something that is not in the training set, but something that is related to that. Like it'll give out a jazz music example. And in sentiment classification, again, this too can be done with convolutional neural networks, but uh, in that case, um, you know, it won't be able to take into things like sarcasm or uh, contextual things. Like uh, if I say the movie is beautifully bad, is it a positive or a negative thing? Obviously you will be able to understand because we are humans, we have that knowledge. But a neural network will just, uh, if a convolution neural network or a natural language processing thing, it just looks into that and it just sees beautiful. Okay, that's a positive word. But if you're looking at the sequence, it is like beautifully bad. So yeah, that information is there. So from there, it'll be able to say, uh, give a rating and give a sentiment classification. Right, another thing is like, you have your DNA sequence analysis. So there are four letters, A, C, T, and G. So from the sequence, the network will be able to predict what kind of a DNA it is. So these are the things where a convolutional neural network will be, um, you know, not the right option to go forward. So you'll have to use something that is better capable to handling sequence data. And in the, yeah, this one is the main one, machine translation. If you have used Google's uh, Translate API, you might have seen the NMT option. That is nothing but neural machine translation. So that is the state of the art right now. That's because it is able to understand uh, the grammar of human languages from looking at uh, hundreds of thousands of data. Right, so something from maybe 10 years ago might not be as good as what we have right now for translation, right? That's because of the advancement of neural networks such as these. And the other thing is name entity recognition, that is getting the names of entities from a text given. So that can be made possible only if the, lang uh, the model has a, you know, understanding of the language structure and all those things. So, uh, from these examples, uh, you might be able to get an idea about RNNs, right? Like what, what it might be doing. Uh, can you, can someone guess when RNNs were invented? Recently, just two years back, 10 years back? Five years. Actually, the first RNN paper came out in 1993. Yeah, and the LSTM paper came out in 1997. But why are they being used now? I'll show it with a meme. <laughs> so the people in that era thought these things are useless because they didn't have the computational power that we have right now. And also because of the boom of internet, we have 
so much data to train on. So these type of networks are proving to be more effective in the era right now because of computational power as well as data. So RNNs, so they take sequential data and obviously they have a memory attached to it. Like uh, if you're looking at a sentence, right? So if it's uh, going to the fifth element in the sentence, it will have memory of what came before. That's uh, one directional. There is also bi-directional RNN, which have uh, memory to both sides. In traditional neural networks, like you saw in the previous session, it will have one input and the output, right? And these are not, uh, like these are, the outputs are independent. This does not in any way affect the next. If you give a cat's, cat's image, it uh, predicts cat. But if you give a dog's image next, the previous prediction does not like interfere with what you predict now. Like there is no like dependency. So like the name suggests recurrent, it does the same task rec uh, recursively, repeatedly. So that's why the name is a uh, recurrent neural networks. So, and also again, the output will be dependent on the previous, uh, you know, computations. Like if you're taking a sentence, if it has gone to three elements, then the next uh, elements prediction will be based on the computation that has come before. So in theory, uh, RNN should work for uh, arbitrarily wrong sentences, right? It should have memory of something that came maybe hundreds of elements ago. In theory, it should, but that is not so in the case of practical usage. I'll get to that in a while. So just to see a uh, you know, comparison between CNNs and RNNs. So first of all, the data that they take in. CNNs just take spatial data, that is fixed data. That's it. And for RNNs, like you said, the time component, right? That is there in the, these type of models. And also one other thing is like in the examples of image classification, what was the size of the image always? Yeah, the dimensions. Three dimensions, Three dimensions yeah, but uh, the size, height and width. Yeah, that will be rescaled into what the model needs, right? Obviously, so all those models take 224 by 224. But in the case of RNNs, you can give, um, in the sentence example, you can give a sentence that is 100 uh, words long or 10 words long, doesn't matter. So it will take all these inputs. You don't have to worry about that. And in CNNs, they have the connectivity like neurons. But in RNNs, there are neurons, but it's like, you know, in a different manner. The weights will be shared. And uh, I'll get to that. And where are CNNs, uh, CNNs best for? See, don't get me wrong, CNNs are very powerful models and they are used in all the tasks like image classification or image processing, all those things, like in YOLO. And also some form of text processing, yeah. And RNNs are very powerful in the case where there's a time component, like speech recognition. Now you have all your, you know, Google Assistant on all those things. It's able to understand whatever you say, even in our in, uh, Indian uh, accent, right? So. Those things are very advanced and RNNs are used all are there. So let's get into the architecture of RNN. Uh, so this will be one unit of RNN, right? And it will have input XI, that is at time I, whatever input is there. And output at that time itself, at the time TI. And the weights WX, WH, and WI. Uh, do you know what weights are? Like these are the things that the, the model is trying to learn, trying to optimize. So in the case of CNN, each uh, unit will have weights. So each, like each layer will have weights. But in our case, RNN, it will be shared in one unit. Like in a recurrent unit, the weights will be shared. And yeah, the, these are the hidden units or the activation layers. Like you saw, uh, use a ReLU activation, uh, TANH and all those things. So these are individual computational units or hidden units. So it'll be better understood with an example. So when it's unrolled, right, when I'm giving an input cat goes meow. So the RNN unit will repeat itself. So at the first time, it will have input as cat, as x1. And after all the computation, first time it will be getting uh, activation from the, initially activation layer, it will be taking random values or whatever you initialize it. 
okay it can be zero or random values so when the first time it input comes the computations are done and one output is given so what you have to understand about this particular example is that our vocabulary consists of words like cat uh, dog goes all these things okay and the uh, objective of this one unit will be to predict what probability or which word will come next if i give cat which word will be coming next uh, is that clear for all of you yeah so if i give cat it will uh, do the computations here and i will get a list of uh, output like this for all the all the like elements in the vocabulary so the word goes will get probably a probability of 0.41 the mind you this is after uh, during uh, like after giving training so when you are giving training when uh, maybe in the first step and all it will be giving wrong outputs or wrong probabilities so the aim of the model is to bring the probability high for the uh, the word that is supposed to come right is it confusing or okay so so what is special about this is like uh, these weights are shared between all the coming layers so what happens is like the computations done in the first layer will be going as input to the next layer so cat goes so the next word comes goes comes so it will have input goes as well as the computations from the previous layer so probably you'll get an output like this uh, so it has seen cat and goes so it should ideally say meow rather than saying uh, bow or something like that okay so so that is how the probability will be like so the aim of the model is to make the probability of the output uh, optimal so that is what the continuous training will do so what you have to understand that is that the wy here and the wy here will be shared so if you know uh, something about neural networks when they are doing training it will do a forward propagation as well as a backward propagation right so in the backward propagation step we'll be adjusting our weights so that the outputs are optimized so in the backward propagation step of an rnn all the uh, like the, all the weights of a single rnn unit will be changed at the same time right so it, because it's shared keep that in mind uh, okay and uh, any uh, doubts on uh, the architecture or uh, so each layer will uh, uh, go through some kind of like epochs like uh, uh, the cat layer like okay, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so basically the okay. probability will be attained after some epochs right when yeah, yeah. the error rate will be so Correct. low so when can we come to an end like uh, okay this is the thing which we going to get okay so yeah the all those things will be same as uh, any other neural network so we'll be at the end of the output we'll be getting a like an output and we'll be calculating a loss same, same same as other neural networks and we'll be coming back so epochs will be yeah same same as the other model itself so after a lot of epochs probably your uh, accuracy uh, your loss will go down and you can uh, test it out and maybe get you know be confident that the model is performing well it's all those things are same for uh, this model also so there are different types of rnn based on the input and output so if there is one input and one output it's just a vanilla rnn it is a, a normal traditional uh, neural network there is nothing happening there so it will just work like a normal neural network because it's not unrolling itself right the sequence is just one input so it's like that and another type is like you give a single input and it gives out a sequence so an example should be image captioning so in the previous uh, session you saw that uh, you will be uh, i mean you know in the image classification you will be getting class uh, the objects from the images will be classified if there's a cat in the image there's a cat and if there is a you know bottle there's a bottle all those things will be tagged by the yolo model right so we can use that in tandem with an rnn to generate a text like saying a summary what this is for example see in this image probably a motorcycle and a man was tagged and with that the rnn was able to say yeah a person is riding a motorcycle on a dirt road cnns yeah correct so in this there are dogs <laughs> so because there are multiple dogs probably it said two dogs see uh, 
Yeah, you can see the example. So this is in combination with the YOLO model and the RNN layer at the end. It's clear, right? So next type is like you give a sequence and give it gives one output. So this is the example which I told you about the sentiment classification. Uh, like, see here, I really like the color of my new phone. It's positive. And I didn't really enjoy the camera of my phone. That's negative. It's very uh, obvious to us, but for a model to learn that, it's you know quite uh, impressive. Because uh, earlier sentiment classification, if you have used NLP techniques and all, you might have done tagging, right? And you take, uh, I don't know, get, get the scores based on the tag, tagged words. So in this example, probably only the negative word is didn't. It just negates the whole thing. See, really enjoy the camera of my phone. So if you're using a simple NLP, you know, it might say this is positive, but that's not a uh, you know, state of the art or desirable. So in that case, an RNN which has, you know, the knowledge of a sequence or what has come before will be very useful. Ah, yeah, this is the popular example that we, uh, we use. This model is called an encoder decoder model. Okay. So you have, you give a sequence and you get a sequence back. That is, if you give a French text and it translates into uh, English or vice versa. The thing about language translation is, is the grammar. The grammar from Tamil or English or Malayalam is very different, right? See, if you directly just translate the words into another language, the grammar might be wrong. So it's very uh, impressive that a model can learn the grammar from the examples given. You can just give, uh, you know, a textbook and just uh, give the words and with that the model will be able to learn the grammar structure. So similarly if you give uh, like um, like combinations of French text and its translation so the model will be able to learn the translation. Right. And this is a, another case where it is synced. The inputs and the outputs will be synced. This example might be in the object typing like in video example, you have to tag an object in each frame. So this might be one frame. So the object tag will output will be one, uh, like one output. So what you can see in the, all these examples are like the green one, right? It is unrolling based on the data. It's not fixed. That's why I said you can give any number of input and as well as you get any number of output because these things will be dependent on what input you're giving. So that's uh, clear, right? Any, any queries? Cool, okay. And now I'll show you an example implementation of an RNN. Yeah, it's all good hearing about theoretical things and all, but it's good that you know understand the implementation because it's really simple. You just have to, if you know the Kira's library and uh, you have seen the example of um, what uh, Shibi has uh, shown you, we'll be just adding this layer extra. That's the RNN layer. So that's it because uh, now I'm using the symbol RNN and the units, this input uh, you see here is the hidden units, right? We saw the units inside each. each node. So these are all hyperparameters which can be tuned to make the model uh, efficient. And then activation function, that can be anything, ReLU, Sigmoid, any of those things. Yeah, then I'm connecting my RNN to a dense layer, right? That is a normal neural network layer and an output layer. So this one will have one output. So I'll show you an example. You're able to see the text, right? So what I've done in this is like, I created a synthetic example. It's not a real data. So I'm creating a sine wave. Uh, so, if I just run this, uh, oh, cool. So here I'm creating a sine wave. Okay, I'm giving thousand samples, right? For thousand samples, I'll be creating a sine wave. So as you can see, there are zero to thousand samples in the range of minus one to one. 
Okay, now this is not a good sample, so I'll add some noise to the set because uh, then only we can see if the model which we are going to make is performing well. Okay, this will be our input data. So from this, I'll be taking 600 as uh, training and the rest for testing. Okay, let's see what happens. So I'm just, uh, you know, so here, as you can see, 600, one, four. So uh, can someone tell me why four here? See, uh, okay, if you're in, in a CNN network, you'll be giving inputs one at a time. So, but in this one, you'll be, give, you'll be giving a sequence of four things. Yeah, you'll be giving four uh, data points and you'll be trying to predict the fifth one. That's the objective. So if you see the input here, I'll just show, there are four points here. Okay. And the Y or the target label will be having one, one data. So this is the model which I showed you earlier. I'm just uh, defining the model here and you can see the summary. Okay. There are 32 units in the RNN layer and dense layer eight units. And why is it one? Because we are going to predict just one, one point. Okay. So I'll be fitting the model, training the model. Okay. So as you can see, the loss is going down. Yeah. Because it's a synthetic example, it's not a real life data. Yeah. After a while it had flattened out. Those things you can take into consideration when you're doing training with the real examples. So, if I visualize the predictions, the orange ones are the predictions. So it's able to predict almost similarly like the uh, input. Clear with, the uh, with this example, right? So you might uh, think that RNNs are like advanced or all those things, but it's when it comes to implementation, it's quite simple. You just need to know what it is and what the input you are going to give to the model then it will be uh, just the process of just calling APIs and making it work. Uh, the, the process of making it efficient is a uh, whole another business. <laughs> okay, so, so I told you, right? In theory, you could give a long text and it should predict and it should work properly. So that's not the case because RNNs have a problem or a drawback. That's called vanishing gradient problem. So in this example, if you see, uh, the, this is the text given, the brown and black dog which was playing with the cat was a German shepherd. So it's able to say it's a German shepherd because of the words probably brown, black and dog, uh, dog. yeah? So it will be able to predict. But between these two texts, uh, there are several elements coming in between. So while training, what happens is like, Probably here it's, uh, it saw the example of black. And maybe here only we are uh, going to predict about the dog's breed, okay? But in since I told you, right, we'll be sharing the weights. That is one of the thing about RNN. So since the sh weight is shared, it is seeing all the other examples here. So for uh, maximizing the, op like optimizing those things, it will be changing the gradients in such a way while training. So what happens is that the gradients or the weights will approach zero. So the, you know, the relationship between this one and this one will get lost in the process. So that's the problem of vanishing gradient. So yeah, brown men doing a forward propagation will not have any effect on predicting the word shepherd. Clear, right? So what could we do? I mean, what is the solution for this problem? There are some models called LSTM. Uh, long short term uh, memory model and also gated recurrent unit. These are the, these models are, you know, designed in such a way that this problem is avoided and it has a, you know, mechanism to keep the memory for longer periods of time. So they use a gating mechanism. Uh, what is a gate? Like, you know, it's a zero and ones. So probably in my model, I'll have a yeah, hundred gates. Okay. And it will be memorizing for each of the elements. So in the normal new RNN, we'll have this line going through all the models. This will be the computation from one layer going to the next layer. Yeah, then it'll be doing the computation and going to the next layer. 
what we have extra here is this line going uh, through the top. Okay, that's the memory cell that is shared between all the units again. So it is like a, you know, it's smart process. So if it sees brown, maybe it will set the gate as one, okay? And when it sees shepherd, since the gate for brown was set, it will say, okay, it's shepherd. It'll predict like that. That will be learned by the model, you know, after a lot of epochs. That's clear, right? Uh, shall I move on to the next thing? Okay. Is it clear or uh, are you guys blank? Clear, right? Cool. Okay. So now I'll be taking an example of language modeling. Okay. That is one of the like uh, you know, good example or a good use case because it's uh, like I told you, NLP has been struggling with this for a lot of time. They maybe, you know, speech to text. That's a big example. We are using it in our daily lives. You'd say Alexa and, and to do it, make it do something. So their speech to text is used and also conversational systems. Now dialogue, uh, you know, chatbots are coming up. You see chatbots everywhere, don't you, right? So these things, all these things need to understand our language, which we are talking in. Then only it's useful. And also there is text summarization. You give it a long essay and you want a summary back. What would you do? Like for us, it's easy because we understand the language, right? So uh, if only a model is able to learn the, you know, uh, interactions or what happens between the words, like the sentence structures, the grammar, all those things are modeled, then only all these things will be possible. That is where RNNs are a strong, you know, point going forward. So what happens while uh, you're training uh, like a long text with RNN is like, it learns which word will come next and which, uh, and which word might be in behind also because it's bi-directional. So with that, if you're able to like, if you give a five element sentence, and if you're able to predict what comes next, there you have it. You have already achieved some sort of, you know, accuracy. There are different types of uh, language modeling. If you have, you will have character level. This type of models will be able to learn, you know, forming words, forming meaningful words. And then there is n-gram level. That is taking, uh, you know, three characters or four characters, n-grams. Okay, then you will have your sentence level models. So in these, we'll be learning to you know, create meaningful grammar sentences. Then there will also be paragraph level. Those are highly complicated model. So when we are training a language model, you'll just give it a huge chunk of text, nothing else. And based on the type of language model you're creating, uh, it will map the probability distribution. So if you're doing character, um, type of language model, what will be the outputs? What will be the, you know, range of data that it can predict? So if it's English language, it's just 26, 26 characters, that's it. So, but in the case of a sentence level model, it will be complex because, you know, there can be 10,000 or 20,000 words. So the objective will be to generate one character at a time for the character level model. I'll be showing you an example of a character level model. So this will be what is going on underneath a character level model. So in this example, I have vocabulary as H, E, L, and O. That's it, okay? I'm not considering the whole range of uh, English language for this particular explanation slide, that's it. So here you can see H is given as input. So you can see the vector encoder as one for H and zero for the rest. So in your activation layer, you will uh, it'll be computing some, you know, the weights and all those things like I explained earlier, those things will be same. And in the output layer, uh, the probability for all the words are given here. For H it is 1.0 uh, and for O it is giving high probability. So when we are training this model, our objective is to make the probability of E or the second one higher. So yeah, then these activations go into the next level. Yeah, uh, you're clear with this, right? What happens in a character level model? Clear, right? Any queries? Okay, so this is the example I'm going to show you. So I downloaded all the seven books of Harry Potter and just made it into a text file. So now we are going to make the eighth book, which is not there, okay? Uh, maybe parts of it. I'm being ambitious here. 
Okay, this is used. Uh, I made this using an LSTM network. Okay, and this is, and and some text processing was done. In books, you uh, usually see the words comma and all those things. Those are ASCII characters. So the range of vocabulary will be ASCII. So it'll be zero to two fifty five characters. So we'll have two fifty six total output sets. Like it will be trying input will be into fifty six and output will be like that. So the training data, how it's given to the, how it's given to the model is like, I'll be taking a sequence of uh, 100, 100 characters and I'll be trying to predict the next 101th character. It can be any number, you can train it. Those are again hyperparameters, you can tune and be better along the way. So this will be, this is a very bare minimum or simple model. So let's see what it can do, right? So this is the model. Here there is an embedding layer extra. Uh, you don't need to worry about this layer. This is used for you know representing the letter, the input better. So when you're giving a word level model, right? So there'll be 10,000 words. And if, if you have an embedding layer, it will represent the word better rather than just giving a one hot encoder like you saw here. This is called one hot encoding. Rather than this, it will be giving a huge vector with you know better representation of the word with respect to all the other words in the vocabulary. And this is our layer, yeah? So this is the LSTM layer that will have 512 activation hidden units. And yeah, this is something extra, right? Can you guess what this might be? Sequ return sequences. Okay, so what what might be the output of this LSTM layer? Will it be the last output? Like, will it be this O or all these things? Or all these things? Bidirectional. Okay, if you give the return sequences as false, it will just return the last output from that layer. So this will be one LSTM unit. It will be doing all those things. And from the output will be one if you, uh, if you give it as false, okay? And if you give it as true, then it will return all the outputs across the, you know, all the rec uh, recursions. And then I also made one more layer of LSTM, the same thing. Then it's going to a dense layer. Now you can see this is time distributed. Why might that be, uh, you know, time distributed? Uh, here we are returning all the outputs, right? So if the if you give it to a dense layer, the there will be a shape mismatch. So to pro, uh, to you know to uh, um, like handle that case, we'll be giving a time distributed layer, and you can see the output as 256. That's because the range of outputs will be in ASCII 256, and since it's the output layer, the activation will be softmax. All cool, right? Okay, and now I'm going to compile, uh, the compilation of model is done using uh, RMS prop optimizer. There are different type of optimizers like gradient descent, Adam, Adagrad, all those things. You can use any of those. And again, the, that's again a hyperparameter which you can tune to make the model better. Uh, I've trained all my models using Google Colab because you know all these models are very computationally expensive so i can do it in my personal laptop that's why google is giving us free gpu access okay so the thing about this model is it even though it is quite simple it will be computationally you know high uh, uh, expensive because of the data we're giving uh, as i told you i'm giving seven books that's how many characters, I don't know. It's a lot of characters, right? So even if it's processed in batches, that'll take a lot of time if you're using just CPU. So here I'm going to run the necessary library series required. Okay, so this is where I'm processing my input. So I've saved my input in my Google Drive. I'm taking it from there. Maybe I'll show you what the input is. Okay. 
so this is nothing but all of harry potter text in one text file okay so what i'm doing here is like converting all the input from letters to ascii so it will be represented as numbers that is ranging from 0 to 255 and then here is the training generator what this will be doing is like yeah, creating batches so we can't train the whole thing at once we have to give it in batches since it won't fit in the memory so i'll show you what uh, sample you know if i give if i give the sequence length as 10 and for one batch what it gives okay so this is the input sequence this is not a good example i'll just run it again yeah it's having maybe this is the word visibility and c so the next sequence will be like one step ahead so the aim of this model will be to predict this character so that's how we'll be trained so what i'm going to be giving for original training will be 100 the sequence length will be 100 So let me change it back. Okay. So you can see the ASCII format. Same thing. So this is where the model is, you know, defined. This is an LFTM model and all those things which I showed you earlier. So let me go ahead and define the model. So okay, this code is different from what you see in a uh, normal Keras training. so this is one tip okay for using gpu you don't have to put specific code but i'm using a tpu here it's a tensor processing unit and this thing is like a, it's good for huge batches of data so it will take if in cpu if i try training this it might have taken uh, probably 1300 seconds for one epoch okay this one takes just 80 seconds so yeah, that's a lot of time saved for you you know for tuning your model So if I train this now, it'll you guys will have to wait probably <laughs> one hour to see it work. So I've already went ahead and trained this model, and I'll just load the weights here. Okay. Okay, that's an error. Okay. Sorry about that. I'll just restart the runtime. There's some issue. See, the thing is, I used uh, APIs from TensorFlow 1.13, uh, but it might have, you know, after a while, I got restarted, so it re it went back to 1.14. So I'll have to change it back for my APIs to work. so any doubts so far on the model uh, what do you think is our training an rnn model quite difficult or is it difficult cost costly yes <laughs> so yeah okay i'll just go ahead and stop it here okay so i have loaded uh, the weights which i already trained um, probably for two i think two hours i just kept it for training so this will be the prediction part so how do you think the model is going to perform is it going to give me a new book which i can publish on amazon and make some money or so this is a character level model so what you have to look is that it will predict uh, it will form words meaningfully right so let's uh, i giving i'm giving this as a you know precursor so it will work from here it will start with the sentence and predict for next 200 characters okay let's see what happens 
So Harry took out his wand and said, "Stripping to the." So you can see that it's creating meaningful words. It's not just gibberish. Okay, sorry. Is it visible for you? So you can see that the grammar is not quite good, right? But the words are meaningful. There are no gibberish there. So that's because we have trained a character level model. So I've also done a word level model, but since the implementation of that is quite out of scope for the session, I just I'll just load it and show you an example. Okay, it's nothing uh, different. It's just the processing of the data will be different. Like when you form the vocabulary, it'll not be just characters. It'll be the whole words, whatever words will come. Ready? Okay, it's giving me an error. I don't know why. Okay, I'll leave it. I think it's because of the runtime. I'm using TPU. See, TPU is, uh, now it's in beta phase. That's why the most of the APIs are not supporting it in TensorFlow also. So it will get stable and you'll be able to use it properly. Okay, I went ahead and did something else also. I took all the text uh, tweets of Elon Musk and trained a model. You know, that could tweet like Elon Musk. So again, the same things are repeated here. Uh, mirror text, that is com uh, like combination of all the tweets. One extra step I did here is like, I removed links that he might be using in his tweets because that will be useless, right? What is generating? Again, the same thing. It is the same model, no hyperparameters changed, nothing else. So let's see how it comes, right? This one also I trained for, you know, several minutes, several hours. Actually, several minutes. Yes, I was impatient. Okay, so let's see what it predicts. So this is the seed text I'm giving it. Uh, my little monster text. This is something or like the way Elon Musk speaks in his, in his tweets. And his tweets are also, you know, controversial. Yeah, different data, that's it. Yeah, so it's predicting my little monster Tesla Model 3 is the best-selling luxury car on the road. No injuries or new features. <laughs> yeah, pro yeah, it'll give a different. <laughs> See, what it does is like, it'll take the input sequence and it'll be trying to calculate the probability for the next character, right? So the probability a character will be taken from a whole in a 250s letters, so it will change. Yeah, again it's saying, my little monster Tesla Model 3 is the best. <laughs> Hell is reliable, and he's tagging some people. There is successful launch from Paddy, a retweet, Elon Musk, you know. <laughs> Maybe I can make a fake account and tweet like Elon Musk. <laughs> okay, uh, that's it for the demo. Any you know, any doubts on how the model is created or on the implementation? Any doubts, any queries? Is it because it's clear, so clear or you're not understanding anything? <laughs> <coughs> okay, one, another like, uh, I know a beautiful use case for RNNs can be, you know, you can generate music, right? There is even a company which uh, signed a label that's creating music using machine learning. That's where we are headed, guys. You're all going to be replaced. Okay, this, this one is like, a, it's a Google experiment. So if I play something, sorry, the volume is down. So the machine, this is the machine playing something back. See if someone knows music here, yeah? So it's not completely bullshit, right? It's trying, it, no, I mean, it's coming out good. 
So yeah, uh, that's my presentation. So the takeaways from is, uh, this presentation I want you guys to have is an understanding of RNNs and LSTMs. Uh, is that is that takeaway done or are you guys clear about like what you need to know in a real you know use case or a real scenario where you're using these things or not the math behind it okay if anyone's interested in the math behind it you can go ahead you know read the papers or uh, like learn some courses but if you're coming to an industry what you need is the basic understanding and where to use it you might not even be training a full network by yourself you'll be just using ready-made solutions but to have that acumen or that knowledge you need to know how this works right so if you're going to use a object detection thing probably i'll be using just google apis that's it because you want fast results and perfect results you're not going to reinvent the wheel so what you have to understand is a basic understanding of what the algorithm is or how it works if you're going to go deep research I encourage you, it's all up to you. Yeah, but in our field, when in engineering or application development, you need to have a high level understanding of it. If you're interested, also the math, but where to use it, that's where the, you know, the power comes. Yeah, the next, second thing is application possibilities. Now, since you know something about it, you might be able to come up with some ideas. Hey, I can use this here, I can use this there. That's the major takeaway I want you guys to have from this session and obviously demystifying it. See, I used to, when I used to see RNNs, I'll be like, oh my God, these, those models are tough, I'm not going to use it. But you know, step, take that step, take that step forward and understand them. They are not complex or anything. Even any, anyone here can just implement a model. You know, I encourage you guys to try it out. I'll share the notebooks I have made and also the PPT. You guys can go ahead and try it, okay? So any question and questions? Nothing? So, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, there is an abstraction one layer above. So if you're using APIs, you'll be just, uh, you know, there are different types. In Google, there is an auto ML thing right now. So you just need to give data and you just need to give clean data and just all the model algorithms, everything will be formed automatically. But the thing about this is like, even yeah, even Azure, there are solutions that are ready-made. But I think there is an option for giving our own custom models as well. Okay, so all these things are there. And the thing, the power they have is data. Google has a lot of data that none of us can get our hands on. So that's why their models are very accurate and you know used used by everyone. So uh, does that answer your question? Okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's also fine. But I'll tell you what the problem is there. Okay. So you're giving uh, maybe a translation, right? You will be giving the data, right? Even if you're using the API, you'll be giving the data. So if you just think it of as a black box, then if something goes wrong, you'll be uh, going back to the data and fixing it. But to know what is going wrong, you need to know what the algorithm is underneath, right? You can use it, but to understand or debug the problem, you might need to know even uh, like a high level knowledge on what's happening, right? Not even the math, just the high level thing, what's going on. Anything else, guys? Nothing? Okay. So yeah, uh, that's been my presentation. I uh, hope you guys liked it. Uh, you can connect me on LinkedIn or anywhere else. And if you have any like doubts or queries on any application you're doing, you're welcome to connect with me. Okay, I'd like to thank ThoughtWorks organization team, uh, you know, for giving me this opportunity. And Shibi, yeah. And thank you all, you've been a good audience. Thank you.